This is In the Shadow of Man, Chapter 3. First Observations. About three months after our arrival, Van and I fell ill at the same time. It was undoubtedly some sort of malaria, but as we'd been told by no less a person than the doctor in Kigoma that there was no malaria in the area, we had no drugs with us. How he came to believe such a strange fallacy, I cannot imagine, but we were too naive to question him at the time. He was an Italian doctor. For nearly two weeks, we lay side by side on our low camp beds in our hot, stuffy tent, sweating out the fever. Occasionally, we mustered the strength to take our temperatures. There was nothing else to do to pass the time, for neither of us felt like reading. You get a nasty headache, usually with malaria. Van had a temperature of 105 degrees, almost constantly, for five days. It dropped slightly only during the coolness of the nights. Afterwards, we were told that she'd been very lucky to pull through at all. To make everything worse, the whole camp was pervaded throughout our illness by the most terrible smell, rather like bad cabbage water. It was the flower of some tree. I forget its name now. I always think of it as the fever flower tree. Oh, it really was ghastly. <laughs> Dominic, our cook, was wonderful during those days. He begged us to go into Kigoma to see a doctor, and when we pleaded that we felt much too ill to face the three-hour journey in our little boat, he made up for our lack of medical attention by constantly fussing over us. One night, Van wandered out of the tent in a delirium and fell unconscious. She was by one of the palm trees on the ground, I never knew she'd left the tent. It was Dominic who found her at about three in the morning and assisted her back to bed. Later he told us that he came along several times each night to make sure his memsabs were all right, the old days when we were memsab. As soon as the fever left me, I was impatient to start work again. Nearly three months had sped away, and I felt I'd learned nothing. I was frantic, for in a couple of months my funds would run out. I couldn't bear the thought of any of my African companions seeing me in my weak state, and so, risking official displeasure, I set off alone one morning to climb the mountain. It was the same mountain I climbed on my first afternoon, the mountain which rose directly above our camp. I left at my usual time, when it was still cool, in the first faint glimmerings of dawn. After ten minutes or so, my heart began to hammer wildly. I could feel the blood pounding in my head, and I had to stop to catch my breath. Eventually, however, I reached an open peak, about 1,000 feet above the lake, and as it offered a superb view over the home valley, I decided to sit there for a while and search for signs of chimpanzees through my binoculars. I'd been there some 15 minutes when a slight movement on the bare burnt slope just beyond a narrow ravine caught my eye. I looked round and saw three chimpanzees standing there staring at me. I expected them to flee for they were no further away than 80 yards. But after a moment, they moved on again quite calmly and were soon lost to sight in some thicker vegetation. Had I been correct, after all, in my assumption that they would be less afraid of one person completely alone? For even when I had left my African companions behind and approached a group on my own, the chimps had undoubtedly been fully aware of what was going on. I remained on my peak and later on in the morning, a group of chimps with much screaming and barking and pantooting careered down the opposite mountain slope and began feeding in some fig trees that grew thickly along the stream banks in the valley below me. They'd only been there about 20 minutes when another procession of chimps crossed the bare slope, where earlier I'd seen the three. This group also saw me, for I was very conspicuous on the rocky peak. But though they all stopped and stared, 
and then hastened their steps slightly as they moved on again. The chimpanzees didn't run in panic. Presently, with violent swaying of branches and wild calling, this group joined the chimpanzees already feeding on the figs. After a while, they all settled down to feed quietly together. And when they finally climbed down from the trees, they moved off in one big group. For part of the way, as they walked up the valley, I could see them following each other in a long, orderly line. Two small infants were perched like jockeys on their mother's backs. I even saw them pause to drink, each one for about a minute, before leaping across the stream. It was by far the best day I'd had since my arrival at Gombe, and when I got back to camp that evening, I was exhilarated, if exhausted. Van, who'd been far more ill than I, and who was still in bed, was much cheered by my excitement. That day, in fact, marked the turning point in my study. The fig trees grow all along the lower reaches of the stream, and that year the crop in our valley was plentiful and lasted for eight weeks. Every day I returned to my peak, and every day the chimpanzees fed on the figs below. They came in large groups and small groups, singly and in pairs. Regularly they passed me, either moving along the original route across the open slope just above me, or along one or other of the trails crossing the grassy ridge below me. And because I always looked the same, wearing similar dull-coloured clothes, and because I never tried to follow them or harass them in any way, the shy chimpanzees began to realise at long last that I was not, after all, so horrific and terrifying. Of course, for the most part, I was completely alone. There was no need for my African companions to follow me up and down, since they knew where I was going to be. When Short had to leave, I decided to employ no other African, and although Adolf and afterwards Saulo David, the new scout, often came up in the evenings to make sure I was all right, for the most part, I was completely on my own. My peak quickly became the peak. It is, I think, the very best vantage point for watching chimpanzees in the whole of the Gombe stream sanctuary. Of course, from higher up, there is a magnificent view in all directions, but the chimpanzees seldom move about near the top of the rift escarpment, for most of their food is lower in the mountains. From the peak, I was able to look southward over our home valley, and also if I walked just a few yards to the north, I could look down into the basin of Lower Casacala Valley, a thick, almost circular pocket of forest. I quickly found that it was easy to cross the upper Casacala Valley, almost on the level, through a fairly open wood, where on several occasions I came across a small herd of about 16 buffaloes. To the north of Buffalo Wood, another open ridge offered a good view over the upper reaches of the narrow, steep-sided Melinda Valley. I carried a small tin trunk up to the peak, and there I kept a kettle, some coffee, a few tins of baked beans, a sweater, and a blanket, and a tin opener as well. A tiny stream trickled through Buffalo Wood. It was almost non-existent in the dry season, but I scooped out a shallow bowl in the gravelly stream bed and was able to collect enough of the sparkling clear water for my needs. So, when the chimpanzees slept near the peak, I often stayed up there too. Then I didn't have to trudge up the mountain in the morning. I was able to send messages down to Van, with whichever of the game scouts climbed to the peak in the evening, so she always knew when I was planning to stay out for the night. For about a month, I spent most of each day either on the peak or overlooking Melinda Valley with the chimps before or after stuffing themselves with figs had large quantities of small purple fruits, which tasted like so many of their foods, as bitter and as stringent as sloes or crab apples. Piece by piece, I began to form my first somewhat crude picture of chimpanzee life. The impression that I had gained when I watched the chimps at the Musalula tree 
of temporary, constantly changing associations of individuals within the community were substantiated. Most often, I saw small groups of four to eight moving about together. Sometimes I saw one or two chimpanzees leave such a group and wander off on their own or join up with a different association. On other occasions, I watched two or three small groups joining up to form one larger group. Often, as one group crossed the grassy ridge separating the Casacala Valley from the fig trees in the home valley, the male chimpanzees of the party would break into a run, sometimes moving in an upright position, sometimes dragging a fallen branch, sometimes stamping or slapping on the hard earth. These charging displays were always accompanied by loud pantoots, and afterwards the chimpanzee often swung up into a tree overlooking the valley he was about to enter and sat quietly, peering down and obviously listening for a response from below. If there were chimps feeding in the fig trees, they nearly always hooted back as though in answer. Then the new arrivals hurried down the steep slope and with more calling and screaming, the two groups met up in the fig trees. When groups of females and youngsters with no males present joined other feeding chimpanzees, there was usually none of the excitement. The newcomers merely climbed up into the trees, greeted some of those already there, and began to stuff themselves with figs. Whilst many details of their social behaviour were hidden from me by the foliage, I did get occasional fascinating glimpses. I saw one female, newly arrived in a group, hurry up to a big male and hold her hand out towards him. Almost regally, he reached out, clasped her hand in his, drew it towards him and kissed it with his lips. I saw two adult males embrace each other in greeting. I saw youngsters having wild games through the treetops, chasing around after each other or jumping again and again, one after the other, from a branch to a springy bough below. I watched small infants dangling happily by themselves for minutes on end, patting at their toes with one hand, rotating gently from side to side. Once two tiny infants pulled on opposite ends of a twig in a gentle tug of war. Often during the heat of midday or after a long spell of feeding, I saw two or more adults grooming each other, intently looking through the hair of their companions. At that time of year, the chimps usually went to bed late, making their nests when it was too dark to see properly through binoculars, but sometimes they nested earlier so that I could watch them from the peak. I found that every individual except for infants who slept with their mothers made his or her own nest each night. Usually this took about three minutes. The chimp chose a firm foundation, such as an upright fork or crotch or two horizontal branches. Then he or she reached out and bent over smaller branches onto this foundation, keeping each one in place with the feet. Finally, he or she tucked in the little leafy twigs growing around the rim of the nest and then lay down. Quite often, a chimp sat up after a few minutes, picked a handful of leafy twigs, which he put under his head or some other part of his body before settling down again for the night. One young female I watched went on and on bending down branches until she had constructed a huge mound of greenery on which she finally curled up. I climbed up into some of the nests after the chimpanzees had left them. Most of them were built in trees that, for me, were almost impossible to climb. I found that there was quite complicated interweaving of the branches in some of them. I found, too, that the nests were never fouled with dung. And later, when I was able to get closer to the chimps, I saw how they were always careful to defecate and urinate over the edge of their nests even in the middle of the night. It was during that month that I really got to know the country well, for I often went on expeditions from the peak, sometimes to examine nests, 
more often to collect specimens of the chimpanzee food plants which Bernard Verdcourt had kindly offered to identify for me. Soon I could find my way around the sheer ravines and up and down the steep slopes of three valleys, the Home Valley, the Pocket and Melinda Valley, as well as a taxi driver finds his way about in the highways and byways of London. It's a period I remember vividly, not only because I was beginning to accomplish something at last, but also because of the delight I felt in being completely by myself. For those who love to be alone with nature, I need add nothing further. For those who do not, no words of mine could ever convey, even in part, the almost mystical awareness of beauty and eternity that accompany certain treasured moments. And though the beauty was always there, those moments came upon me unaware. When I was watching the pale flush preceding dawn, or looking up through the rustling leaves of some giant forest tree into the greens and browns and black shadows that occasionally ensnared a bright fleck of blue sky, or when I stood as darkness fell with one hand on the still warm trunk of a tree and looked at the sparkling of an early moon on the never still sighing water of the lake. Precious moments. One day when I was sitting by the little trickle of water in Buffalo Wood, pausing for a moment in the coolness before returning from a scramble in Melinda Valley, I saw a female bushbuck moving slowly along the nearly dry stream bed. Occasionally she paused to pick off some plant and crunch it up. I kept absolutely still and she wasn't aware of my presence until she was little more than 10 yards away. Suddenly she tensed and stood, one small forefoot raised, staring at me. Because I didn't move, she didn't know what I was, only that my outline was somehow strange. I saw her velvet nostrils dilate as she sniffed the air, but I was downwind and her nose gave her no answer. Infinitely slowly, she came closer and closer, one step at a time. Her neck was craned forward, always paused for instant flight. I can still scarcely believe that her nose actually touched my knee. Yet if I close my eyes, I can feel again in imagination the warmth of her breath and the silken impact of her skin. But suddenly I blinked and she was gone in a flash, bounding away with loud barks of alarm until the vegetation hid her completely from my view. And that, even now, was the most amazing interaction I ever had with a bush bug. It was rather different when, as I was sitting on the peak, I saw a leopard coming towards me, his tail held straight up. He was at a slightly lower level than I, and obviously had no idea I was there. Ever since I arrived in Africa, I had had an ingrained, illogical fear of leopards. Already whilst working at the Gombe, I had several times nearly turned back when, as I crawled through some thick undergrowth, I'd suddenly smelt the rank smell of cat. I'd forced myself on, telling myself that my fear was foolish, that only wounded leopards charged humans with savage ferocity. On this occasion, though, the leopard presently went out of sight as it started to climb up the hill, the hill on the peak of which I sat. I quickly hastened to climb a tree, but halfway there, I realized that leopards could climb trees too. So I uttered a sort of half-hearted squawk. The leopard my logical mind told me would be just as frightened of me if he knew I was there. Sure enough, there was a thudding of suddenly startled feet and then silence. I returned to the peak, but the feeling of unseen eyes watching me was too much. I decided to watch for chimps in Melinda Valley for a while. And when I returned to the peak several hours later, there, on the very rock which had been my seat, was a neat little pile of leopard dung. He must have watched me go, and then, 
very carefully examined the place where such a frightening creature had been and tried to exterminate my horrible human scent with his own. As the weeks went by, the chimpanzees became less and less afraid. Quite often, when I was on one of my food collecting expeditions, I came across chimpanzees unexpectedly. And after a while, I found that some of them would tolerate my presence, provided they were in fairly thick forest, and provided I sat quite still and did not try to move closer than 60 to 80 yards. And so during my second month of watching from the peak, when I saw a group settle down to feed, I sometimes moved a bit closer and was thus able to make more detailed observations. It was at this time that I began to recognize a number of different individuals. As soon as I was sure of knowing a chimpanzee, if I saw it again, I named it. Some scientists feel that animals should be labeled by numbers, that to name them is anthropomorphic. But I've always been interested in the differences between individuals. And a name is not only more individual than a number, but also far easier to remember. Most names were simply those which, for some reason or other, seemed to suit the individuals to whom I attached them. A few chimps were named because some facial expression or mannerism reminded me of human acquaintances. The easiest individual to recognize was old Mr. McGregor. The crown of his head, his neck and his shoulders were almost completely devoid of hair, but a little frill remained round his head rather like a monk's tonsure. He was an old male, perhaps between 30 and 40 years of age. The longevity record for a captive chimps is 47 years. That was then. We know they can live more than 70 years in captivity, but so little was known about chimpanzees back then. During the early months of my acquaintance with him, Mr. McGregor was somewhat belligerent. If I accidentally came across him at close quarters, he would threaten me with an upward and backward jerk of his head and a shaking of branches before climbing down and vanishing from my sight. He reminded me for some reason of Beatrix Potter's old gardener in the tale of Peter Rabbit. Ancient Flo, with her deformed bulbous nose and ragged ears, was equally easy to recognize. Her youngest offspring at that time was two-year-old Fifi, who still rode everywhere on her mother's back. And Flo's juvenile son, Figgen, was always to be seen wandering around with his mother and little sister. He was then about six years old. It was approximately a year before he would attain puberty. Flo often traveled with another old mother, Ollie, Ollie's long shaped face was also distinctive. The fluff of her hair on the back of her head, though no other feature, reminded me of my aunt Olwyn. Ollie was also accompanied by two children, a daughter younger than Fifi and an adolescent son about a year older than Figgen. Actually, those chimps were a little older than I thought they were then, because of course we've learned so much over the following years. Then there was William, who, I'm certain, must have been Ollie's blood brother. I never saw any special signs of friendship between them, but their faces were amazingly alike. They both had long upper lips that wobbled when they suddenly turned their heads. William had the added distinction of several thin, deeply etched scar marks running down his upper lip from his nose. Two of the other chimpanzees I got to know well by sight at that time were David Greybeard and Goliath. Like David and Goliath in the Bible, these two individuals were closely associated in my mind, for they were so very often together. Goliath, even in those days of his prime, was not a giant, but he had a splendid physique and the springy movements of an athlete. He probably weighed about 100 pounds. David Greybeard was less afraid of me from the start than were any of the other chimps. I was always pleased when I picked out his handsome face and well-marked silvery beard in some chimpanzee group, 
for with David to calm the others, I had a better chance of approaching to observe them more closely. David remains the most special chimpanzee. Before the end of my trial period in the field, I made two really exciting discoveries, discoveries that made the previous months of frustration well worthwhile. And for both of them, I had David Greybeard to thank. One day I arrived on the peak and found a small group of chimps just below me in the upper branches of a thick tree. As I watched, I saw that one of them was holding a pink looking object from which he was from time to time pulling pieces with his teeth. There was a female and a youngster and they were both reaching out towards the male, their hands actually touching his mouth. Presently, the female picked up a piece of the pink thing and put it in her mouth. It was at this moment that I realized the chimps were actually eating meat. After each bite of meat, the male picked off some leaves with his lips and chewed them with the flesh. Often when he had chewed for several minutes on this leafy wudge, he spat out the remains into the waiting hands of the female. Suddenly, he dropped a small piece of meat and like a flash, the youngster swung after it to the ground. But even as he reached to pick it up, the undergrowth exploded and an adult bush pig charged towards him. Screaming, the juvenile leapt back into the tree. The pig remained in the open, snorting and moving backwards and forwards. Presently, I made out the shapes of three small striped piglets. Obviously, the chimps were eating a baby bush pig. The size was right, and later when I realized that the male was David Greybeard, I moved closer and saw that he was indeed eating piglet. For three hours I watched the chimps feeding. David occasionally let the female bite pieces from the carcass, and once he actually detached a small piece of flesh and placed it in her outstretched hand. When he finally climbed down, there was still meat left on the carcass. He carried it away in one hand, followed by the others. It was lucky the pigs had gone by then. I doubt if he would have gone down if the pigs were still there, because they can be very dangerous. Of course, I was not sure then that David Greybeard had caught the pig for himself, but even so, it was tremendously exciting to know that these chimpanzees actually ate meat. Previously, scientists have believed that whilst these apes might occasionally supplement their diet with a few insects or small rodents and the like, they were primarily vegetarians and fruit eaters. No one had suspected they might hunt larger mammals. It was within two weeks of this observation that I saw something that excited me even more. By then it was October and the short rains had begun. The blackened slopes were softened by feathery new grass shoots, and in some places the ground was carpeted by a variety of flowers. The chimpanzee's spring, I called it. I had had a frustrating morning, tramping up and down three valleys with never a sign or sight of chimpanzee. Hauling myself up the steep slope of Melinda Valley, I headed for the peak, not only weary, but soaking wet from crawling through dense undergrowth. Suddenly I stopped, for I saw a slight movement in the long grass about 60 yards away. Quickly focusing my binoculars, I saw it was a single chimpanzee. Just then he turned in my direction, and I recognized David Greybeard. Cautiously I moved round so that I could see what he was doing. He was squatting by the red mound of a termite nest. And as I watched, I saw him carefully push a long grass stem down into a hole in the mound. After a moment, he withdrew it and picked something from the end with his mouth. I was too far away to make out what he was eating, but it was obvious that he was actually using a grass stem as a tool. I knew that on two occasions, casual observers in West Africa had seen chimpanzees using objects as tools. One had broken open palm nut kernels by using a rock as a hammer, whilst a group of chimps had been observed by someone else 
pushing sticks into an underground bees nest and licking off the honey. But somehow I'd never dreamed of seeing anything so exciting myself. For an hour, David feasted at the termite mound, and then he wandered slowly away. When I was sure he'd quite gone, I went over to examine the mound. I found a few crushed insects strewn about, and a swarm of worker termites sealing the entrance of the passages into which David had, obviously, been poking his stems. I picked up one of his discarded tools and carefully pushed it into a hole myself. Immediately, I felt the pull of several termites as they seized the grass. And when I pulled it out, there were a number of worker termites and a few soldiers, the ones with big red heads, clinging on with their mandibles. There they remained, sticking out at right angles to the stem, with their legs waving in the air. Before I left, I trampled down some of the tall, dry grass and constructed a rough hide, just a few palm fronds, leant up against the low branch of a tree and tied together at the top. I planned to wait there the next day, but it was another week before I was able to watch a chimpanzee fishing for termites again. Twice, chimps arrived, but each time they saw me and moved off immediately. Once, a swarm of fertile winged termites, the princes and princesses as they're called, flew off on their nuptial flight, their huge white wings fluttering frantically as they carried the insects higher and higher. Later, I realized that it is at this time of year, during the short rains, that the worker termites extend the passages of the nest to the surface, ready for these emigrations. Several such swarms emerge between October and January. It's principally at this time of year that the chimpanzees feed on termites. On the eighth day of my vigil, David Greybeard arrived again, together with Goliath, and the pair worked there for two hours. I could see much better now. I observed how they scratched open the sealed over passage entrances with a thumb or forefinger, I watched how they bit the ends off their tools when they became bent, or used the other end, or discarded them in favor of new ones. Goliath once moved at least 15 yards from the heap to select a firm looking piece of vine, and both males often picked three or four stems while they were collecting tools and put the spares beside them on the ground until they wanted them. Most exciting of all, on several occasions, they pick little leafy twigs and prepared them for use by carefully stripping off the leaves. This was the first recorded example of a wild animal not merely using an object as a tool, but actually modifying an object, and thus showing the crude beginnings of tool making. Previously, man had been regarded as the only tool-making animal. Indeed, one of the clauses commonly accepted in the actual definition of man was that he was a creature who made and used tools to a regular and set pattern. The chimpanzees, of course, had not made tools to any set pattern. Nevertheless, my early observations of their primitive tool-making abilities convinced a number of scientists that it was necessary to redefine man in a more complex manner. Or else, as Lewis Leakey put it, we should, by definition, have to accept the chimpanzee as man. I sent telegrams to Lewis Leakey about my exciting new observations, the meat-eating and the tool-making, and he was, of course, wildly enthusiastic. Indeed, I believe that the news was helpful to him in his efforts to find further financial support for my work. It was not long afterwards that he wrote to tell me that the National Geographic Society in the United States had agreed to grant funds for another year's research. What an exciting time. And reading that chapter takes me right back. Those moments of discovery, that gradual acceptance. It was an amazing time in my life. And 
reading this book just it's very nostalgic. I hope you enjoyed learning about that. <laughs>